One, two, three, four. Martin Chambers. He was the reason I wanted to play drums in the first place. And the Pretenders, the reason I wanted to be in a rock and roll band when I was a kid. He's a Hall of Famer with the Pretenders, but also played with Mott the Hoople, Dave Stewart the Eurythmics, and many others. I was going to go into this long, drawn out bio of the Pretenders and how their music saved me as a kid, but all you really need to know is that one Christmas, my stepsister gave me a shoebox filled with bubble yum, and I traded it plus ten dollars on top to the neighborhood bully for two cassette tapes recorded off the radio KLOS 95.5 in Los Angeles of the Pretenders Live at Santa Monica Civic Auditorium. Those two tapes wore out in a matter of months teaching myself the drums and guitar. I also remember getting in trouble at school once for writing a book report on the Pretenders when everyone else was reporting about where the Red Fern Grows, Charlotte's Web, Moby Dick, Catcher in the Rye, etc. The teacher asked me, what book is that from? And I said, the history of the pretenders? I was weird and obsessed about my favorite bands. Once a week I would go to a music market in Costa Mesa, California and spend hours thumbing through posters, vinyl, cassettes, eight tracks, stickers to see if there was anything new I missed from my favorite band. But I believe that obsession drove me to be a better player, and it was rock and roll that saved me from a darker time. As a musician, I've stolen countless grooves and fills from Martin to create my own style. To me, he was a mix of John Bonham and Keith Moon, but with better meter, more discipline, and more diversity. The Pretenders were born out of the synthy new wave scene, but Martin was pure rock. His power cut through my 106.7 FM Los Angeles radio speakers like cannons. The new record is called Hate for Sale, and everyone should go out and buy it. It comes out July 17th. Martin's a really busy guy these days, prepping to tour to support Hate for Sale and doing a lot of press, so I was really humbled how much time he spent for me on this interview. If I only had one interview for this channel, period, this would be it. This is the top. So here you go. One last thing, I'll break it up into two parts, and maybe a bonus third part if I get the green light. Part one begins with Martin asking me how my accident happened, and it starts right here. I've been, uh, uh, so anyway, coming back, show number one, playing with Roger Fisher. I get Magic yep. Guitar Lead in my in-ears. Oh my God, this is rad. Very first show of the tour, I'm driving back. We just had a huge snowstorm, and I live up in the mountains, so there's switchbacks. I, get, I flip over, probably going a little too fast, ejected out of my car. Oh, um, so this year... This year was hanging off, concussion, five broken ribs, but the spine thing, <laughs> I was laying in the road. That, there's actually a police report that says, upon approaching, I was advised that he is deceased or soon to be. So I still have that, you know, thing, but um, paralyzed. And how are you? How are you now? So I'm like 70%. Um, I'd had a drum set delivered to the, to, um, the hospital. And the nurses yeah. and the doctors were like pissed off. So I'm like on electric drums, just trying. To, uh, I'm about 70 percent where at least where my ego was, you know. Yeah. And yeah, I walk kind of like I walk like Frankenstein a little bit in the morning. I have to lean up against the wall by like 5 p.m. I'm like, hey, he's a normal human. And then yeah. it starts to go down again. But well, I, you're young. You're young enough. You've done great. And uh, thank God you, you you got through it. But you're young enough for it to really set back good um if you were my age uh -huh. you 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 know it, you wouldn't stand much of a chance you know yeah to recover i'll tell you, I'll tell you what like as far as recovery like i've been listening to all these positive podcasts and i try to go on walks and drumming all the time and um one of them is, is mike tyson out and, and talks to his best friends or whatever and yeah people world champions come on his show and they're like, they're like crying. They're like, I can't believe I'm with Mike Tyson. You know, there's people who just destroyers, you know, current, current champions. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so much respect. And I can make the parallel, you know, without being too gushy. It's like, 
this like this is for me this is it just mm-hmm. just that you were to spend time and like just this week when i knew you would come on with me i'm like oh my god i wasn't able to do that drumming last week i can do it now mm-hmm. like yeah you take for granted um like the the heartbeat like that yeah and on yeah. the beat Totally different foot muscles. Totally. Yeah. You, if you're normal, you're like, eh, it's nothing. Yeah. No, totally different. So, like, just that inspiration for, yeah, you spending the time. It's like, oh, it, yeah, it, that, the, it just raises you a bit. It raises you a little, you know. Yeah. It's it's it's, it's a it's a great thing. There's all sorts of little uh, moments creating music and and talking to people and everything else. We we as musicians are feeding off people yeah. and feeding off all that. We don't notice it so much, but that's part of the makeup of being an artist. You're sucking it up all the time, even when you're really old. Maybe you paint, and you know, there's no, you know, I'm lucky to live in the country. It's never the same. There's always a different mood. There's this, you see that, da, da, da. and I get great inspiration by being in the countryside. Me too. I've been trying. I don't meditate. I'm 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 really kind of go 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 go. Yeah. And yeah. lately, I've just been like, you know, I raise chickens, I raise bees, um, I you know, dogs and cats, and I I just sit in the backyard at like two in the morning, and I'm just I'm trying to be grateful, you know. I'm That's in the, it. I'm in the mountains. I have fruit trees. I I teach music for a living. I, I I can play shows. I'm not dead, you know. I'm I'm trying to get that back because last year after the accident, it's like this isn't gonna get me. Like I was yeah. actually yelling it at Roger and his brother on the phone while I was in the ER. Like you're not going to replace me, <laughs> you know? Yeah, like right. yeah, yeah. I didn't cancel the show. You canceled the show. Like total asshole, you know? Like yeah. no perspective. And this year it's like, all right, here's reality. Every the country's shut down. Let's concentrate. Let's be grateful. Mm. It's been crazy. In uh, your part of the world, you get uh, black bears. Yeah. Do you get any grizzlies at all there? Uh, not so much the grizzlies. Uh, do you, you probably, get elk? Do you get elk? Elk, yes. There's like do you, elk, so elk. you must get puma. You must get cougar major lion. Where I live right next to Cougar Mountain. Oh, fabulous! <laughs> there's three mountains: there's tiger, cougar, and squawk. Squawk is our mountain. We live on a little lake, um, but yeah, Cougar Mountain. You got to go more towards like Wyoming, Montana. Yeah. To get the grizzlies. Yeah. Yellowstone, yeah. all that. a lot of black. And how about um, lynx? Do you get any lynx there? Bobcats. Bobcats, yeah. Bobcats, beavers, deer, elk. Um, yeah, that's uh, the, those are the. It's, the it's great to see those. You see, I live in a country where nothing can kill me. Yeah. And I really love being in countries where there are things that can kill you. That makes you feel alive, you know. Uh, a day after tomorrow, I was due to fly from Des Moines to Denver up to Jackson Hole to do uh, a week in Yellowstone. Wow. And my plan was to get there, go the opposite way to everybody else. So I end up completely on my own. Uh, buy a, uh, a, a drone and send the drone up <laughs> so I could see if there's any bears around and have a really good look. For about half a mile around me, have a really good look. Yeah. Um, you know, just just because it's just a thing flying in the air. For the large geysers, I've been there so many times. That's yeah. the look. The drone looked down into the, the rainbow colored um, cool. paint pots and all that stuff. That's the best look for it. Um, yeah. You can go to Earthquake Lake. If you're over there, Earthquake right. Lake is pretty unique. The whole like city was sunk. Wow. You can still see cabins like sticking out of the water. It's in and the road goes right 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 by it. It's pretty, there's yeah. a lot of cool history there. I went to Salton Sea to make a video with Dave Stewart once, and it was all, you know, all cars were just rotting in this in the in the saline solution, and clearly that used to be a big community, but no more, you know. Yeah. Have you been there before? <clears throat> Yellowstone. Yellowstone. And no, uh, this is the point. It was going to be a big trip. The next one was for me to drive a NASCAR. We were going to have these breaks, you know, these weeks off. So in during the tour. So I, the next break for me would have been go to Daytona and drive a NASCAR. Yeah. I mean, buy, buy at least 25, 30 laps so you could really get up to speed, you know. 
Yeah. And um, and then Cape Canaveral and Cocoa Beach and all that, and then rejoin um, rejoin in Florida, continue the tour. So mm. I miss it out on all this. But the great thing is I get an English summer back, and uh, you know, if you count my the remainders of my life in summers, yeah, Here. I'll be lucky to get that many. That's still that's Hereford area. Yeah, it's between uh, Harryford and Ross, pretty much, and Lebry. It's in that triangle, and it's just cool. It's cool, and it's it's just it's very private here. That's why I like it. Me too. I'm an isolator. Yeah. So when you do Yellowstone, you should do the Grand Tetons too. It's right. It's basically when you exit Yellowstone Park. It, the Tetons is also a national park, but it's it's south, it's right south or west. It's in the. Um, uh, Wyoming, like the Wyoming border. So I'd say yeah. south, south. Right, well, that's the way I'm coming in Jackson Hole direction. Jackson Hole, yeah. Maybe Harrison Ford will uh, rescue you in a helicopter or something. He's known for yeah, that. Yeah, he's, he's getting on a, a bit now for that. <laughs> we actually got our dog from his son when I was down in. Oh Olympia. yeah. Back, it was crazy. He's a he's a wrestler. Looks just like him, except he's like five feet tall and super stocky. Oh right. He's an animal lover, and he put up a. He put up a post about finding all these pit bull puppies in Chinatown of L.A. that were stranded. And we asked, oh, man. went over to his house and then later found out that, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm Willard. I'm Harrison Ford's son. That's crazy. Careless people. I, I, you know, I, I, that's one of the reasons I live here. I don't want to see. OK, think global, act local. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You've got to do that. But, you know, once it goes on and on as a program. You know, it's like I know what's going on. I don't need to watch it. I don't buy newspapers. I haven't done for years. Yeah. Um, stay abreast with the way that everything's going. But my concern is just not the concern of 94 percent of the rest of the population of the planet. And that species lost. Yeah. We're losing so many species. They're getting they're getting so rare. You know, I got two pairs of swallows here this summer. This is a barn. You know, yeah. what is the summer without a, a, a a barn swallow you know it's just awful and nobody seems to get it it's yeah. just going you know and i could go on for a long time about that but uh, on the positive note um i'm looking forward to you know finishing off my days with the pretenders because yeah. to be quite honest i'm fit i'm bloody fit because i'm working around here all the time i'm not just sitting there with a the remote control in london yeah. and this is critical when you get to i'm 68 now so to be fit enough to do what I do the way I do it is totally different to just playing the drums. Yeah, I, uh, gosh. So if you wouldn't mind at this point, we can go through some musical stuff. Yeah, I'm sure. not a good, good idea. Or I'm just a guy, so I'll try to make it linear. Um, Go on. Yeah. The reason, yeah, the reason is like you know, so I'm, you know, to sound stupid, I'm literally learning drums. I'm learning to crawl again after the. Yeah. Accident. So I'm going back to like what got me started in the first place. Yeah. Good. So um, good route. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say everyone go out and buy Hate for Sale. Who follows me? Uh, as soon as it comes out, what it got delayed, right? I think so. Okay. Originally it was May first, and um, mm. I think it may be July first now. I don't. I oh. you know, I I I don't stay in touch with it too much. I just know what I got to be. I got to be ready to when we start again. And I, that's why I've got the, that's why I got this um, yeah. set up here, right in this room, so I can, My house I can, room. yeah, and I can play, I can play along to, um, to whatever the last set yeah. we played. I can play the new album, and yeah. you know, you yeah. just get yourself ready for rehearsals. For me, just to get everybody up to speed. For me, do an hour, and I'm ready to tour. Mm -hmm. But of course, Chrissy wouldn't have played much, and you know, everybody has to get up and and make sure we got the the routine down so uh, i like to be ahead of the game sure um were you when you started were you self-taught or did you go to private lessons i just sat on the arm of a chair with some pillows to my right for a tom-tom yep. and tapped along with shadows records and mainly instrumentals and uh, and then all all sorts of songs but just generally the basic coordination i learned a few rudiments but not very much yeah i tend to follow the song and try and bring the song raise the song a little you know yeah. i'm a song player you know i follow the vocalist closely and um, i'm not so much of a, a rhythm section guy 
yeah. Me too. Self-taught and even to the yeah. point of, like learning your stuff. I I listened back in the day on vinyl, so there would be I'd play it so much there'd be skips. So I'd actually memorize the skips as fills too. <laughs> when coming up, it's like, is this my odd meter? No. So I, I remember, uh, you know, stuff out Pretenders too, or even Call Me by Blondie. There was a verse that skipped, and I'm yeah, like, eh. yeah, yep. Yeah, if, that's it. Yeah. That's um. You were talking. I at first I didn't know what that was a drummer has a sound like you have a sound there's drummers that when they hit the drum it's different you know and like I knew a, I, I saw a story about when Chrissy was like laughing at the wall the first time you guys jammed I'm like this is this is the lineup I've experienced that I've been in three bands that have done major labels and a few other indie labels where every every band that did anything there was an experience like that where yeah. people it's cracking up in the middle of a song and it's because they can't they're happy like oh my god there's something here you know it's an interesting statement to make though turn to the turn to the laughed and turn to the wall and laughed mm -hmm. why i don't know is that is that like pride or something like you're protecting yeah like, that's what i mean interesting I know it, I know it the time or um you know we'll I see was doing the okay, same we were all that's yeah, we were all doing the same thing. We were all going, man, this is great. This is it, right? And Jimmy and Pete and, and I were looking at one another and Chrissy and everything. But she looked at the wall when she got that first buzz. Yeah. In interesting. Yeah. No, it's very, very similar experiences. But when I talk to – you never think that – like I don't, I don't think that you know you have a sound maybe. Maybe you do. But when you hit a drum, you sound different than um, when when Stuart Copeland hits hits a drum, et cetera. You, yes, you, well, I think part of that actually is when when I started, you know, it was like lots of bands. It was a Watkins 15 watt amp with the vocals and all the guitars through it. Yep. And the drums, so not a problem. But within that was 67. So by the time we got to the end of the 60s in 1970. I found myself having to compete because you never mic the drums up. So as soon as everything got louder, uh, amplifi amplification got louder, I just stepped up a bit. And I've kind of stayed at that, you know, full dynamics from nothing to, to full out. But but that's the reason that I, I hit the snare drum very flat, so it's almost like a rim shot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I play like that because it's the it cuts through pretty good. It's the right way that that is very yeah I, I recognize that too like your snare drum fills the room like I've had I've had friends that I've tried to start side bands with who are in very popular like number one single kind of bands uh, yeah guitar player in third eye blind for instance just in a sign and we started we had a side band and at the same time I was busy in other stuff auditioning for smashing pumpkins auditioning for offspring whatever yeah I would tell him like hey I got an invite from the manager I'm gonna go audition for offspring and he's like he's like that's cool but have they played in a room with you yet and i was like no and he's like make sure they play in the room with you and make sure these bands like what does that mean it's like because you hit the drums a certain way like it's not going to yeah. to the internet they're going to feel this you know thing and i was like I, I didn't understand it and over time i totally understand it i mean especially you know when uh blair came in the band or whatever it's like i saw yeah. those shows and i was like um i'm out for a while <laughs> can't do it because you provide an emotion to the songs you provide your own swing i guess they call it a swing an energy to it like trey cool of green day has it no song ends up every green day song ends up faster than how it started and that's okay with me because that's their sound you know mm -hmm. you play in an emotional way when you play punk stuff i hear your anger i hear your emotion mm -hmm. but you can lay back i go to sleep Bir birds of paradise um yeah yeah, I'd love to play that song again, Birds of Paradise. It's so strong. The guitar lines in it. Yeah. It's just strong. I'd love to play that one again. And um, yeah, it'd be kind of nice to revisit. Chrissy likes playing the new stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Of course. A um, uh, couple quick stories that you know again learning how to play drums um there was a bully on my block who he liked um 
he liked the doors and he liked more of this stoner stuff, but he always recorded in LA. The rock station was 95.5 KLOS. Yeah. He yeah. And he recorded live at the Santa Monica civic back in the day. Oh, right. But I was, I was the obsessive fan. Like, why do you, and he, and he, I saw that someone told me that he had the, he recorded it on three cassette tapes. Yeah. I've got a copy. <laughs> and I was like, Hey, uh, you know, I'll, I'll trade you or whatever. It was my birthday. Really? Was it? It was my birthday. They all sang happy birthday to me. The trouble is, after the first couple of songs, the bass goes out of tune. Yeah. That's the only bummer, because it's such a good show. Um, it's just one of those things. The bass went out, and it was just that bit where it becomes really fucking annoying to listen to. It was a pretty... I don't know how to say it, maybe psychedelic version of like what I thought the pretender sound was like even on. Um, so the the precious version on extended play, that was just so bashing, like Argh! it was like so yeah. cool. There was, and there's a lot of that going on. And a lot of those in the middle of your songs at the Santa Monica Civic, there was a lot of these extended middle parts where Jimmy would like fiddle yeah. around and like get it got pretty trippy. I was like, wow, this is the pretender. Yeah. Like improv, what's going on? And yeah, we extended some uh, we, intros. We changed the intros, uh, like the weight and stuff like that. We changed uh, 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 phone call. I think the ending of phone call was elongated with a little bass thing and a guitar thing back then. So it, it, it turned it more into a show. Each song was turned into a bit more of a show, predominantly those I've mentioned. And it added complexity to the to the to the players too, because if you just hear brass and talking on the radio, you have no idea that these guys are running through each other's legs and you're throwing sticks a mile into the audience and doing all these really cool dynamic tricks and stuff. And it's like, wow, yeah. this is something different. Come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. I, I, again, on the Santa Monica Civic. So, like, listening to that stuff over and over again. Um, were you using a double kick sometimes back on that tour? Was it was it the Pretenders Tour tour? Were you did you always have a single kick? Kick drum? Uh, no, I mean I was I had two bass drums with a Ludwig kit. Yeah. Uh, but originally no, I didn't have two bass drums. Um, but I uh, but I did when I got the Ludwig kit, which was probably around the second album period. Mm-hmm. Because I then, um, yeah. I was just gonna say like. Um, there were some things maybe I was hearing ghosts that it sounded like you were doing triplets with like a, a double kick in your floor tom and like instead of a normal triplet da, 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 you were actually using a double kick. Dun 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 it was bass drum, bass drum, snare drum, snare drum. Be like it sounded to me like it was two bass drums. No, it was just the one. That was it. And I would change hands. I would go ba da da ba 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 da da ba ba. You know, just for entertainment. And at the same time, know. back forth crashing. I mean, yeah, that's crashing that's across. A strong man. That is a yeah, strong man. Yeah, it's just, and that's why I have the symbols high. I want a lot of movement, you know. Yeah. Uh, rather than just having the kit nicely positioned, just to play. I mean, there's more to it than playing. As long as the playing's good, yeah. then why not, you know, do a, a little more visual playing? You were very visual. I mean, fa- yeah. I'm, I'm going to get to this in like 30 seconds, but... Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. How much more visual? <laughs> Let me tell you the story on that kit. I, I got the Sonar deal, and... Um, I wanted it made. I got it made at John Henry's. It was a good guy there. So I said, this is what I want. Back in the days of early jazz, yeah. you would get the, the Charleston pedal, which is like a, a hi-hat on the floor. Mm. You get three or four skulls along the top of a big bass drum and a low snung, long snare. But coming off the bass drum, you'd always have a cymbal on a bit of spring metal shaped like that. Only small. Right. Maybe a 12 inch symbol, if that, eight inch. And that was the, and I thought that's a great idea. If you made them bigger, 
for the first time, ladies and gentlemen, you can see the drummer. <laughs> you, know, you always get these pictures of drummers, and it's like this. There's the picture of the drummer, you know? And it's like, that opens it up. That's panorama now. And also, they move like this. They kind of did this sort of thing. Um, the right, so everything was curved round, and it, it, it was a good, clean-sounding kit. So uh, it, it, it was good, but a bit bombastic, maybe. But, you know, we were trying to, I was trying to come back after the death of Jim and Pete, so yeah. I wanted to maximize everything. Um, preference on why you didn't use two heads on your tom? Why you just like the single tom? It was the way the sound guys like to do it. Mm. Stuff a big whatever the hell that big thing is up into the, you know. Yeah. I mean, even in the studio with Chris Thomas, I would always, you know, he always got great sounds to interpret the music really well. But I did, uh, I did say to him once, I said, well, you know, that doesn't sound very good. And I said, well, it sounds good for me. You know, why don't you put a pair of speakers where my ears are? Yeah, right. You know, you put a mic on a drum, it ain't going to sound anything like the way you hear it. So, you know, there's that sort of thing. And it's like, why would you have... It's like with guitar amps, too, and recording. Why have the mic right up against the speaker? Use ambience or use a reflex or some something to give you the sound like you feel on stage. Because that's what you want. Yeah. That's what you're trying to get. Yeah. And it did... I mean, this kit did have, have a lot of attack, too. You can hear that stick noise for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, it gave you all that room to throw the sticks around. Like, what? where did the water thing come from and the stick thing come from? Is that just... Well, first of all, I never I never threw sticks. No, no. You... I, I, I let people like Clem Burke try things like that. <laughs> you know, throwing them up in the air and catching them. Oh, yeah, yeah. I like the more chaotic method of yeah. hitting, you know, and then chaos takes place, and that can be a lot of fun. I've had crosswinds on festival stages where I just use my left knee to lift the snare drum, yeah. bang it up, it goes over that side of the thing, and the wind just grabs it, and it comes straight back to me. It's just phenomenal. I should have been in a circus. <laughs> but uh, w with oh, regards to getting them, out, getting them out into the uh, audience in the early days, I bounced them off the cymbals so it would go boing and land on them rather than go straight in, because that's dangerous. I had lots of people coming back with... Oh, yeah with blood on their face going, great gig, man, you know, and it's cool, but I, I, I don't want to injure anybody. I hit Pete in the temple once, yeah. and uh, after he kind of regained a bit of consciousness, it was dripping down his face. He loved it because, you know, it must have looked pretty cool to have his face covered in blood, you know, but this was the band as it was in those days, and um, I, the idea of the, the water uh, when we first started doing gigs, um, they had the lighting guy had lights near my legs. My legs were burning. My hair was, bur you know, it's so hot uh, yeah. in the small gigs where you've only got about four feet of space for lights and stuff. I just used to cover myself in water and go on the drums. It would come up off this off the tom toms, and I just didn't care. And people liked it, so I, you know, did it more. I mean, with yeah, with the, the backlighting you had, because that was the first time I saw you guys was the it was in L.A. at the Universal Amphitheater. And, uh, you know, as a little kid and I was being like bombarded with pot, I was like way at the top. You know, I was just like so excited. I think the alarm, that band, the alarm opened for you. Yes. I wanted to have a little reservoir of water on a drip feed onto the Tom Toms. Yeah. So I could turn it on on certain numbers <laughs> because the lights would dry it off pretty quick. As soon as you didn't play it for maybe 30 seconds, yeah. the drums would be almost dry. So it didn't. But you, all you had to do is just click that and the water would be there. So every time you had, you know, it's like a real, it sounds like, you know, yeah, it sounds, it different. looks like, you know. it looks amazing. Of course, yeah. I try it after that, you know, it's stupid little, uh, high school dances or whatever it's like you yeah. know i did realize that if anyone wants to do the stick trick you make sure your drums are at the proper angle <laughs> you're gonna get oh, it yeah. too now, so oh it's dangerous oh it's dangerous yeah. it's dangerous going up and down that's why i usually put my head to the left i usually do it my right hand yeah and get my head out of the way and then just check out where it's gone yeah i'm gonna throw a weird weird question at you it's um Andy Kaufman and the Friday's show. Yeah. Besides your performance in that, I'm so, 
I'm so um, into this moment because I did so many chores that week, so I was able to stay up late to watch this. And when he pulled that, I think that was like the first time I ever cussed in my life, you know. And I was a little guy. I was wow. like, what is going on? Because the curtains close. Like, do you have any other uh, short little snippet about that other than, like, what is going on? I can't remember it at all. <laughs> I remember Andy Kaufman. He was quite strange on camera. You know? Yeah. Um, but what song did we play? Uh, actually, you did Louie Louie, and I think you did wow. Message of Love. Message of Love first, and then Louie Louie. Which was Is it on, uh, on YouTube? Is it on YouTube? I haven't tracked it down. It's just, like permanent in my mind but what i was thinking right. is i wasn't that in the movie you know why well, wasn't that in man on the moon because that was one of the strangest things like right at his peak of as mm. SM. and i remember like chrissy like that was one guy from the back going rock and roll you know and he's yeah like, oh no no not yet and then the curtains closed i was like what and i had to go back to the school the next day and i was just like cussing at everyone like i can't believe it <laughs> all those chores and stayed up that late and this guy this weirdo and uh, Michael Richards, I know from from Seinfeld, was in that cast during that right. time. Yeah, that was crazy. And no VHS recorder. Right. Um, so your your buddies in the band pass away. Chrissy has a baby, and then there's Us Festival '83. Yeah. Remember that? That for me, like when I saw the ad for that, and I think they called it New Wave Day. It was like Missing Persons Berlin. You guys, you two. Um, yeah. And the odd one for me was I think Stevie Nicks played later, and I, and I was like, eh, what? How does that? And then uh, Little Steven from The Sopranos opened up the whole day, which is oh Little really? Disciples of Soul. He was the very first act. I didn't see it, but I knew that where, where he came from. I was just like, this is New Wave Day. Okay. I know. remember it well because we went over and Chris Thomas was playing keyboards with us mm -hmm. on these five warm up dates, and then the US Festival because we, and then when we played. Um, when we played um, Dallas, we were doing the Bronco Bowl in Dallas. And the day before, the day before, Chris and I went to see the support act for Billy Idol. Mm. Because he'd heard about him and they wanted him to produce them. So we went along to see what were they like. And they and the singer looked like a young Mick Jagger, kind of lots of movement. They were really good. I liked the sound of them, and that was in excess. <laughs> so they were the support band. That's the first time I'd seen them, and uh, Chris did a really good job of making records with them. So, oh yeah, and Michael Michael was a dream. And what a guy! Another guy that's gone. So uh, you they know, sound like I don't even know how to classify those guys. It's like yeah, really complex, interesting influences, especially well, the way things. Chris Thomas was a big influence simply because they would come to him with a song and he'd say, how's it go? And he'd go like, they go, it goes like this. Jink, jink, jink. What do you think? <laughs> and he went, -da 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 -da. Mm -hmm. jink, jink, right? And they got a riff, they're off. And that song didn't take that long, but that was what Chris does. He yeah. just says, how about that and complete that little thing and then you've got a nice phrase to sing over and then you can go and do, 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 you know, and it's, it's a build-up from Chris, and Chris is one of the best ever producers. Yeah, that's why you listen to songs that are over forty years old, like uh, our first two albums. There, they sound great. There's no dating going on. Nope. Each song is portrayed, and it'll be there forever. It's it's fabulous. What do you think of that? Uh, what do you think of that drummer? There's another guy who had like a layer of Simmons. He had like rotos in the one row and. Simmons over the top. It was really unique sound. He had. Was pretty yeah. Sick. Oh yeah. Uh, what's his name again? Um, uh, he was a, one of the brothers. Brother. Yeah, I know. I, I, can't, I can't recall his name. I'm sorry, but yeah, great player. Really good. He fitted the ba The band had a shape like yeah. the Stones. You know, put Ringo in the Stones and Charlie in the Beatles. See how that sounds. Yeah, right. That, that fucks up your hundred best drummers of all time, best albums of all time. Such a media-driven pile of bullshit. Yeah. You just just have the right guy that makes the right kind of shape. And, you know, and that was what was great about it. Excess, the whole band. Same with the Stones, the Beatles, all of that. You just, you know, it works because of the number of the people in it. Yeah. It's not just the singer. That's why it didn't work when you were missing. 
that's the it's that's like, the difference. A band should be a band, and and the, yeah. the sound is because it's a band. That's why I'm playing on this new record. I yeah. knew it was going to be the more more of a band record than yeah. anything for many many years. So uh, when Stephen Street was going to do it, I thought, right, I'm in. Right. Um. Yeah, I mean, even that first record, or he did the first three records, but to me, because I I mix a little, I produce a little, I've had a yeah. one band where I play all the instruments, blah, blah, blah. he added a lot of what I call laser beams, like these these yeah. action. Because I've heard the demos, you know, of the first three records and, and stuff like that. And it's like the songs are totally solid. But it's to have that extra magician in the room, like really makes the difference. The editing and the fading and the. Um, yeah. Helping out. A magician, a, ma yeah. a magician as opposed to an elephant. Yeah. <laughs> oh, a slight. So, you know, I teach little kids in the area and when I, 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 I bring them what I call like my drummer's tool belt, which is just like large shapes of things you should know that you should always know and carry into whatever band you're playing with. And it's things like um, uh, the po I call it the pogo. That's like the mystery achievement beat, making people jump up and down. Um, uh, the shuffle versus straight, you know, so I'll show them message of love. I'll show them something straight so they get that. Bad Boys Get Spanked would be like more like a high-speed country western feel, getting that yeah. down with your hands. Um, and then, uh, you know, the Bo Diddley beat, that's like porcelain. Um, and uh, if, if they have these, like, large shapes, they can take them into any room, you know, and then people like, hey, do you know the Bo Diddley beat? Hey, do you, can you – no, you need to more – it's it's too straight. Can you shuffle that out, you know? Yeah, so it's funny because that came up on this new album because we had um, Cuban Slide, mm -hmm. which is which is a Bo Diddley That's beat. And I'm sorry, I said Portland, I meant Cuban Slide. Yeah, no, it's okay. And then this one, um, uh, This Lonely, the song, um, didn't think I'd be this lonely or whatever it's called. I just heard the riff yeah. and it's kind of Bo Diddley, but it isn't. And it's great to play. Um, but... You take it directly from the way J James was playing the chorus. So, you know, boom, jet, boom, jet, boom. You know, it's just getting it spot on with the riff. And exactly. then the rest of the song was, uh, was, was, you know, that was an easy one to do. And then, um, you know, uh, drummers my age learning or whatever, they get, I'm into Rush and I'm into Dream Theater and I'm into Tool and I'm into all this odd meter, odd meter stuff. But I mean, you go back, it's like, I was taught odd meter to the pretenders early on, you know, you got tattooed love boys or a waste, not want not, or, you know, there's, there's several others where you're phone call. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Phone call. Exactly. It's like, you don't, you don't need to be a progressive long hair rock band to like, and it's those little links. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's 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 pulse. You get the pulse and stay mm -hmm. with the pulse to make it go wah, you know. Yeah. And um and basically it's just magical. Chrissy had those down. You know, she didn't know. She doesn't know musically what bars, whatever. She just knows I want to do it like this. The great thing was she always did it consistently. Mm -hmm. That's why we, Pete and I used to baby talk the parts before we recorded them. And we get it exactly. absolutely right so that Chrissy would play and we'd get it with her and put a pulse in there. And yeah, yeah we did, Pete and I did a bit of work on our own in rehearsals for, for, for those songs. Right, so someone walks into the rehearsal room and goes, "I have this perfect breakdown for Tattooed Love Boys. Watch this." <laughs> it, like, how does that even happen? No, because, that's what Chrissy like, played. So we were, that's such yeah, a we were just we were just rehearsing what Chrissy plays. Yeah, to get it so that we're spot on with her and everything else, and it 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 just needed a little bit of attention to make it powerful. Mm -hmm. Crazy. It's yeah, it's like you know, you're learning all these hit pop songs and then through osmosis or, or subconsciously you're like <laughs> I'm counting on meter and i don't even know it because the song is so catchy yeah yeah it's it's funny because we had 44 months together that band pete jimmy myself and chrissy 
you know, my best mate on the road. Life was absolutely fantastic. Mm-hmm. But it was hairy. It was hairy because we were we were traveling. We were doing a lot of work. Yeah. Um, we were we were, uh, you know, a lot of work and not much sleep for two and a half years, three years. And where did your hand injury land in that time frame? Was it that would have been 81, I think. Yeah, that would have been 81. And we were in in Philadelphia. And uh, uh if I can ever get a, a book published, it's all down. I've nearly finished the book completely, so I can start trying to get something sorted for that. But uh, basically, it was one hell of an evening. I mean, the whole thing around me doing my hand and the reason why and everything else, you know, and we had to skip, you know, gigs we've never been to, like Edmonton and Winnipeg. and We were doing a proper Canadian tour, and that was cancelled. And for... For the Canadian fans, but I, I'm still apologizing because we've never done those cities. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was a hell of a night. But uh, you know, the the truth on that is in my book. It was a hell of a night. Yeah, I remember a couple MTV interviews about that, and and uh, it, I mean, it's uh, well, that's with the that was with the official story that I had to tell. Because mm-hmm. if it you know, if I'd have told the truth, we we wouldn't have had any insurance. Yeah, not a lot of not a lot of info came out about that. I thought it was like a lamp. No. That, that's all. That all. And uh, I remember you making a comment a long time ago. Like, there's a bleeder. We've got a bleeder, and you thought that was. Right. That's it. That's what the police officer said. <laughs> and also, my shoe that I'd taken into the car, I tried to put my shoe on my right shoe. Had a, had something, a bag about that big block in the end of the shoe, and I couldn't get my shoe on. You can imagine the the pungent smell coming out of that bag. So, yeah, it's just like it was. It was a heavy. It was a really. But you know, we were all pretty much. Um, uh, Chrissy came into my room later, and I pretended to be asleep. But what she was saying was like we were all pretty blasted from oh. all that work, oh. and it, something was happening. You know, and um, if you know, it was a surprise. Really, it was me because I'm usually, you know, on it. But uh, in Philadelphia at the it was this hotel where the um, uh, what's it Legionnaires disease, the Bellevue Stratford, I think it's called, mm-hmm. or was called. But yeah, things happen on the road. And then the first couple shows back, were you wrapped up or taped up or medicated or anything like that? Were you nervous coming back the first couple shows, or did you make sure you were totally? Well, there's another story attached to this because what happened was. This one was un- unaffected, my right hand, so I, I could hold the stick like that. Mm-hmm. These three were bandaged up big time, and I had some of like 32 stitches going right across the, from there all the way around. So those were unusable, so I was holding the stick like that. And the first gig back was, um, was Dublin, and we went to Dublin, and as Soundcheck approached, I was in the room with Jim and Pete having fun, Mm-hmm. And this was, you know, all wrapped up still and everything else. And I was juggling. What was I doing? Juggling with Guinness bottles <clears throat> with two fingers here and this hand that was at the time. OK. And one of them. I missed one of them and it bounced on the floor and I thought, well, I'll be clever and catch this with my left hand. Right. And the boys will think I'm brilliant. It hit a, it hit a leg of a chair on the way back up and broke the bottleneck. So there was a shard of glass with a hole in it like that. And I grabbed it and it's it cut right round this finger, right through the muscle. So that one was wrapped with. Um, I told him to put a lot of stitches in it. He said, why? I said, well, I'm playing a gig tonight. He said, what do you play? I said, drums. He said, you can't do a gig. So these were out of action. So I could only hold the stick like that. And I couldn't use that finger. So I was holding the stick like that. So that I mean, it was just yeah. and at the moment I did it. There was a knock on the door. You know, and it was our manager coming to get us for sound check. I opened the door because I was stood next to it, and there was a little fountain of, of blood coming out of my finger, and the blood faded from his whole body. He went white with an injury, and it was the, oh my. Yeah, Thanks, folks. I'm sure you had a handful of those. I know I have falling off stage, broken bones. I've played with all sorts of injuries, man. I mean, it's just Surgery. I did a whole tour with two metatarsals broken and yeah it's the adrenaline helps there's something about too i i personally have a thing where like 
right when I'm about to go like out on a, a Duff, the band's called Loaded, a Duff tour, I get so ramped up for it. And I used to run a lot pre-accident. And I would run so much, I'd run my body out. And so I would, <laughs> it's like a pattern. I'd have to like injure myself somehow. So like, I couldn't be like completely healthy. I'd have to have something to work against. It was like really odd yeah, kind of pattern. Um, I'm going to jump over. And anytime, um, anytime you're done, just let, let me know. I just have a, a few more things. Some uh, nights I stay up till midnight, so it's fine. Cool. Uh, Live Aid. Um any uh, any side backstage stories that you thought were funny that you might want to reveal? I, I remember the set, and the thing that I remember about the set is that um, you know, looking for you know, I watched the England the English side, and then I, and Jack Nicholson came on and introduced Brian Adams, and here comes the American side. So yeah, Jack. No, fans, I weren't I wasn't too into, but I was looking for, and I was like, I can't wait till Robbie can just really shred. These leads over this audience, like here comes rock and here's a rock and roll band, you know. And the volume was down on his mix so low. I was like, oh no, like middle of the road lead. And it was like he's like doing all this stuff, but you couldn't really hear it. And I was like, man, that sound guy. Um, but the set was yeah, yeah. The, the set was great. It looked like you guys were having fun, but it looked extremely. Well, live aid, what live aid? There's a load of things. Uh, you know, there's probably I could tell you stories that would go on for at least half an hour. Um, but one of the funniest ones was uh, there was a call sheet for, um, you know, rehearsing We Are the World. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, being the good Boy Scout, off I went to this, this room for a rehearsal. And the only people that turned up was an actor. I can't remember his name offhand. <laughs> and Peter, Paul and Mary. And me. <laughs> and, and and I think it was Paul Schaefer was conducting or something. Right. Or other. So we went over it, and within 30 seconds of us all singing, it was Peter, Paul, Mary, and Martin. They came closer. They had their arms around me. It was all very touchy feely. Oh. We are the world, you know, Jesus. <laughs> but that's all that turned up. And then on the night. I didn't even bother going on the stage. There must have been, you know, it was, there was nowhere to stand. Right. So, and then it got interesting, and my life was saved by Tony Thompson, mm. who was doing, who was he playing with that That's day? Nasty. He did Power Station, and then he also did Led Zeppelin, yeah. Phil Collins, Duel. That's it. So, I was ask if you got it. So, if you got uh, it. After, after, the, after the singing of the final thing, and, and it's over. I'm there on my own. Nobody else is there. I can't remember if Chrissy was there, but she'd organized a car to run straight off the stage in the car and gone, you know, as everybody did. Everybody but me. <laughs> right. So I'm coming out and it's a it's a dusty backstage with cars getting out and and I'm stood there going, oh, shit. I hadn't thought of this, you know, and, you know, I didn't have a manager that really cared. So, yeah. um I was just in this, like, you know, apocalypse with dust around me and vehicles shooting off. Suddenly, a van pulled up next to me and the door came open. And he said, get in. And it was Tony Thompson. Oh, well. God bless him. That's how I got Savior. <coughs> Definitely. Were there any favorites um, that day that you saw? Like, wow, this is this is amazing. It was a pretty important day. Everybody felt the importance of it to 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 have uh, the music community making a, a global event was extraordinary. And um, uh, the background of it is somewhat unfortunate. But yeah. at the end of the day, everybody knew what was going on in Ethiopia and Sudan. And, and that was the point. Um, yeah. The... The day itself, I remember being a bit disappointed with Dylan and Ronnie and, and Keith Richards, and it was all a bit of a mess. Um, good, but, you know, they were busking it pretty much. And, um, uh, yeah, I can't. it was all very interesting. I mean, I watched nearly everything, you know, but there was a, a lot going on. I had my daughter there who was one year, one year old. I think she, she slept through everything. 
Um, she was a good girl. And, um, you know, so it was it was great. I got to go. I got uh, given the keys to his car and the keys to his house of uh, a wonderful tennis player, Vitas Carolitis. And I stayed in New York after the gig for like four or five days oh. out at his place at King's Point. That was wonderful. He was a great guy. God bless him. I was, uh, I, one, one thing that stuck out to me that was really odd, and sorry to RU, REO Speedwagon fans out there, but I remember uh, at one point during the set, he was like, oh, we've got one more song, we've got to get out of here and get on a plane and go to uh, whatever, Wilmington, Delaware to play a show. And I'm like, where else do you have to be, dude? Where where do you got to go? Like, that's like, uh, yeah. know your room. Like, you don't got to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Like, Remember the room number. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, crazy stuff. I had lots of good stories that will be in the book about that. Loads and loads of them. Really great, funny, exciting stories. Meeting people, you know, for the first time. And uh, yeah, just just great because it's the same with everybody. Everybody was uh, came through and you it's a small community, the music industry. You know, you meet these people and they know who you are. It's like that's the bit that gets me. I meet people and they know who I am. It's crazy. It is. It's just, I'm a country boy, you know. I'm I'm just a country boy. 